All right, we can start now. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Christina Stanju, and I'm the director of the Humanities Research Center at DCU. And I'm glad you're here to help us kick off our first event of the series, Meet VCU Authors. In partnership with VCU Libraries, our Meet VCU Authors series invites members of the Richmond community, as well as colleagues and students from VCU and other local universities to meet VCU authors as they talk about their re recent books and answer questions about their work. Although we still can't meet in person this semester due to public health concerns, we look forward to recognizing our VCU authors in the College of Humanities and Sciences in this format before we can resume our talks in person. Our speaker today is Professor Ryan Smith, Professor of History here at VCU, where he has taught since 2004. He specializes in American religious history and material culture, and he is the author of three books. Uh, the most recent ones are Gothic Arches, Latin Crosses, Anti-Catholicism, and American Church Designs in the 19th Century, published in 2006 by the University of North Carolina Press, and most recently, Death and Rebirth in a Southern City, Richmond's Historic Cemeteries, published in 2020 by Johns Hopkins University Press, and the subject of today's presentation. The book has been named one of the three finalists in the nonfiction category this year in this year's Library of Virginia Literary Awards, and the winner will be announced in October. Fingers crossed. Professor Smith received his MA in history from William and Mary and PhD in American civilization from the University of Delaware. He's the coordinator of two digital initiatives involving cemetery work, which um, I will post the links to in, in our chat. Um, the first one is Richmond, uh, richmondcemeteries.org, and the other one is the Judah Will. Maybe you can say a few things about these during your presentation. Um, a few things about this book, Ryan will introduce us to his research and, and discoveries. Um, just a, a very brief introduction to the topic. Uh, Richmond, Virginia holds one of the most dramatic landscapes of death in the nation. In this book, Professor Smith offers the first comparative study of its cemeteries from the city's founding to the present, emphasizing also efforts toward their preservation. Using a range of archival sources, interviews, and analysis of the sites themselves, Professor Smith traces the disparities between the grounds preserving the legacies of privileged whites and those worn away, dug up, and built over undermining the memories of African-Americans, indigenous people, and other challengers to the city's order. The book also reveals the latest efforts to restore such sites, pointing towards similar reclamation efforts across the South. Um, and if we were in person right now, I would encourage you to help me welcome Professor Smith with a warm round of applause, which we can also do virtually. Professor Smith? Uh. Thank you, Christina. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation, and uh, I know I've heard from many friendly faces who said that they were going to come today, and I appreciate all the support that I've gotten from the VCU community, and um, glad at least we can get together on Zoom. Uh, I appreciate the uh, the introduction there by Christina. The Humanities Research Center has been really integral to getting this book put together. Uh, the HRC provided me with um, workshop chapters with colleagues that helped me uh, edit and revise and refine the writing. I also was uh, the beneficiary of one of the research fellowships that gave me a semester off to write the portions of the book. And uh, I've received some funding from the Humanities Research Center before that helped with some acquiring some of the images and things like that. So it's been a really uh, essential component of, of doing the work here that's resulted in the book. And of course, I also want to thank so many of the descendants and the students and the volunteers and my colleagues, the activists and the leaders who have all worked so hard on the topic that I'll be presenting today. Um, let me just say a little bit about the origins of the project about 10 or 11 years now, I've got a friend, a colleague at the University of Richmond named Doug Winiarski. 
And uh, I, my background is, as Christina mentioned, the study of the American religious landscape, really, in American material culture. So looking at objects and architecture and what we can learn from them about um, faith in America and in American history generally. And so knowing that I had an interest there, he suggested that maybe we co-teach a class on the history of the city's cemeteries. He wanted to call it City of the Dead. And it struck me as a creative idea, an unusual idea. Uh, and so we indeed started to teach that course. And so if I could share my screen now with you, uh, I'll, I'll show you what we saw when we began um, to think about putting that course together. Here's the, the cover of the book that I'll be talking about today, Death and Rebirth in a Southern City with the cover photograph by Brian Palmer, a local photographer with quite an international reputation. So I was excited to get that uh, the beautiful shot that he provided there from Evergreen Cemetery. Um, here is the beginnings of what the landscape looked like when Doug Winiarski and I began taking students out to review the city's cemetery landscape um, of, of all sorts, of all backgrounds. And we knew that the so-called burial ground for Negroes, as it appears on a map from 1809, was going to be an important site to start with. And so you can see in these photographs from eight, from excuse me, from 2010, what it looked like at the beginning of, of me getting into this topic. Um, I'll remind you that this, with Zoom, you may have the little box with my face on it or the other panelists here, the participants on the right of your screen. And hopefully you can use your mouse to drag that around to move it off of a particular image if you wanted to get a closer view. Uh, but obviously at the image here, I think it's pretty stark to see that this is just an ordinary looking parking lot in the shadow of the VCU health campus and the hospital there and uh, Interstate 95 as it runs through downtown Richmond. And so there was really very little signage or anything to represent what the history of the site was, but only within a few years, by 2016 and certainly even earlier, um, that site had been transformed, the parking lot had been removed, um, it was, the signage had gone up to place it on part of the city's commemorative slave trail. So there was interpretive signs, there were interactive displays and areas for um, communal engagement from, from descendants who would trace some ancestry here to this first burial ground for people of African descent in the city. And so this, we were watching this unfold as we would visit year after year and class after class. And we could also see the site come alive really and, and become engaged in a way that was uh, really inspiring. And so in the upper left, you're looking at one of the annual Gabriel uh, evening commemorations that the Defenders for Freedom, Justice, and Equality would hold to recognize uh, the story of Gabriel and its possible connections with this burial ground, Gabriel being the enslaved blacksmith who was co helping coordinate uh, a conspiracy to overturn the system of slavery in 1800. And below it, we get another just really creative performance uh, display activity at the site uh, orchestrated by Free Bangura and the Alegba Folklore Society in 2019, uh, Brother General Gabriel there on the grounds that was, it was quite moving. And then those of us who have been in Richmond for a certain amount of time, we remember the, the struggles over the proposal to put a baseball stadium down in Chaco Bottom that would have joined the site and then at the very bottom on the right, you see a memorial park design that emerged out of some of the discussions that the Defenders for Freedom, Justice and Equality and others um, helped put together. So it was a super fluid site that was changing right around the time that we were starting to think about bringing students out into these landscapes. And so the same thing happened right here at VCU in 1994. Hopefully many of you are aware of the discovery of a 19th century well an old water well that had been um, used as a receptacle for cadavers used in the study of uh, anatomy classes at the Medical College of Virginia. And those remains had been expeditiously removed and then sent off to the Smithsonian in the 1990s to make way for that construction. And Sean Utsi's film and several uh, others uh, got interested in what had happened to those remains and what that story meant for VCU. 
And so Sean Utsi's Until the Well Runs Dry came out in 2011 to, to document that history. And indeed a family representative council was put together in the 20 teens. And so just a couple of years ago, we saw the return of those ancestral remains and they're embraced by the family representative council um, that helped welcome those ancestral remains back to Richmond, uh, back to the medical campus, and then ultimately for right now to the Department of Historic Resources. So a really big change in terms of how uh, those remains were, were recognized and we're looking towards the reinterment of those remains ultimately in the area. Here's another site that, that changed before our very eyes, uh, semester to semester, was East End Cemetery and Evergreen Cemetery. On the left, we see very prominent Black Richmonder, Rosa Dixon Bowser, a real pioneer in the field of education and uh, community organizing and community organizations. That's her family plot at East End Cemetery when we first started going out there in 2010. And similarly in 2011, that's what uh, Maggie Walker, the famed president of the bank that's affiliated with the Independent Order of St. Luke, the grand secretary of that organization, a civil rights pioneer in her own right, um, an incredible influence on the community. And so it, it, it looked uh, not the way we would have expected those grave sites to look, and certainly not the way we would expect those cemeteries to look, but just within a few years, and I'm gonna flip back and forth so you can see again, look at the Rosa Dixon Bowser plot and the road that's been opened up, the, the pathway into the very deepest reaches of that cemetery, which before were more or less impassable to us when we started the work. And so with the help of a lot of volunteers and a lot of organizations, you can see that that cemetery in East End had been almost entirely uncovered and, and cleared out by 2017. And then on the right, we see the Maggie Walker plot transformed as well and opened up and ready for an engagement in a way that it hadn't up until the, just the beginnings of our, of our tours. There's plenty of other sites around town and I'm gonna do a brief survey of them as we talk today to get everybody grounded in the story that the book has to tell. Uh, but it's not just a story of transformation at African American burial grounds. In the upper left, we see big changes at the first Jewish burial ground in town. That's the Franklin Street burying ground as it looked in 2011 or so after a, a new housing complex was built right up to the very edges and what had before been open space. Um, in the bottom left, we see a new theatrical performance enacted each October at uh, St. John's Churchyard by the St. John's Church Foundation. And so there's a reenactor um, uh, conveying the story of Elizabeth Arnold Poe. In the middle, we see the Friends of Shaco Hill Cemetery, who's been very active in the last 10 years, raising new markers for graves at their Shaco Hill Cemetery site. That's one for Daniel uh, Norborn Norton that they've uh, showing off there for the cameras. In the upper right, we see Joanne Meeker leading new tours out at Richmond National Cemetery that had been somewhat sleepy before she got engaged. And then in the bottom right, even Hollywood Cemetery that we associate with a lot of visitation and a lot of high profile attention, um, they created their own Friends of Hollywood Cemetery group. Uh, started some beautification projects around that cemetery, some conservation projects, and there they are on a picnic day with the, uh, the ice cream truck and the food truck behind them, and there's a bluegrass band playing uh, on that, that picnic area that they had set out on a, on a day. So we found an incredibly lively landscape in the cemeteries and seeing new individuals engage with these sites in ways that were really surprising. Our students, I... I'm so proud, took a, a big interest in helping propel this work along um, and to engage with this work. They were in the upper left, we see them at St. John's Churchyard interacting with the tour guides at the sites. In the bottom left, we see a student-led protest at the um, one time known as the burial ground for Negroes, now the African burial ground to try to reclaim that from the parking lot situation that was there before. In the middle photograph, we see VCU students and faculty there, Susan bodner Darren, helping to clear out Evergreen and East End Cemetery in that particular photograph. In the upper right, we see students doing digital mapping projects at Barton Heights. And then one of my own students, um, William Oaks, in the bottom right, even got a 
a job as the full-time gravestone conservator at, at uh, excuse me, at Hollywood Cemetery, their first full-time conservator on the staff there. So students have done an enormous amount of uh, work and engagement to help re reawaken these sites and, and reposition the landscape uh, as it had uh, come to be uh, laid out at the beginning of all of this, uh, of this fluorescence of effort. And so what I wanted to do heading here into the book as I was teaching these classes and getting more and more inspired by the activists and the volunteers that we met, I wanted to provide the students a way to share the research that they were doing. Not only were they engaging in cleanup days or mapping, they were doing individual research projects. And it seemed like a lot of these cemeteries did not have good signage for historical tours. If individuals wanted to go take a tour there, some of them did not have histories written of them. And so we were putting together histories of them. So we, we launched this website in 2012, richmondcemeteries.org, still active today. It's had about 80 or 90,000 hits since then in, in that about nine or 10 years or so. And so we think that it's hopefully providing a, an audience some rich material that they might not get uh, elsewhere and otherwise. Um, we showcased a lot of student work on this website. There's podcast individual audio guides that the students did deep dives onto individual markers that caught their eye. In the upper right, we see the grave marker for Thomas R. Johnston, a fireman killed in 1921. And our students, Wendy Love and Catherine Schmitz did an incredible job peeling back the layers on that story on how he died and what the family left behind did. Um, there was another great podcast. This is just a sampling of, of dozens that we've got on the website, but there's a really nice one for Eliza Poe, a really fascinating one for J. Andrew Bowler at Evergreen Cemetery. And maybe I'll, for just a moment, play uh, just a couple seconds of one of these podcasts so you can get a sense of what they're about. The way my computer is set up, I can't hear the audio playing, so I don't know how far we got into that, but you can obviously view those or listen to those on your own time, but I'm just so proud of the student work. And that brings me really to putting the book together, the idea for the book. If there's a tremendous amount of activity taking place and the students are doing great research and the possibilities here seem quite open, um, we start with the assumption that this, as Christina said in the introduction, that that Richmond has a nationally significant landscape of death, so to speak. It, it was the largest British colony during the colonial era. Uh, it played key roles in the American Revolution and as we know in the American Civil War. Uh, it was the center for the slave trade. It had a very early presence, obviously, with the uh, importation of enslaved Africans. It played a big role in reconstruction and the lost cause, immigration, industrial development. This, this, this has a landscape really unlike many others across the United States in which we could tell that story from the colonial period all the way up to the present. Um, but most of those sites either didn't have their own histories written about them, or if they did, they had somewhat, in the case of say St. John's Churchyard or Shaco Hill Cemetery, rather thin, smaller picture-oriented histories of what's going on. Holy Cross Cemetery. So these three had a nice attention to them. The, the stories beneath the stones came out while I was writing the book, which gives a great profile of Richmond National Cemetery. Hollywood Cemetery had generated a lot of attention. It has three or four books alone on it, including Mary Mitchell's really pathbreaking Hollywood Cemetery History of a Southern Shrine. But notice how each of these is focused on one individual site. And then on the far side of the screen, on the right, you see two important histories of African-American cemeteries in the city or in the region. Veronica Davis's pathbreaking, Here I Lay My Burdens Down, brought a lot of the African-American cemeteries in the city onto the same page, but didn't do a lot to connect those to non-African-American sites. And Lynn Rainville, Hidden History, looks at a lot of the sites of African-American cemeteries outside the city, a little bit further to the west around Amherst and Albemarle counties. And so I was looking for something that could bring these stories together. And in a very selfish way, I wanted someone who might be interested in picking up a book on Hollywood Cemetery. I wanted them to be able to see how Hollywood connected with 
another cemetery like Evergreen Cemetery or East End Cemetery or even Richmond National Cemetery to see how these stories are really connected to one another and intertwined. I'm not sure we can really fully understand one without understanding the development of all the others as well. Um, I also was concerned with the preservation of these sites, not just telling their origins and their histories, but it seemed like if we were gonna take the uh, subject of these cemeteries and what they can offer us as historic source material seriously, then we need to take seriously what's been preserved and what's been destroyed and why things have been destroyed. So there's a social justice angle to this book as to uh, kind of how the cemeteries got into the condition that they are today and why there's so much disparity between different categories of grounds. Um, regional studies of cemeteries outside of Virginia look a lot like this as well, that they're, they're kind of split up between individual sites. And so here's a map of all the major sites that the book tries to cover in a number of chapters and about eight chapters. It's arranged chronologically, uh, beginning with some of the earliest graves in the city, um, a, a, a reference to indigenous graves, the Palatan before the arrival of the English and during the period of colonization, all the way into the 20th century with the founding of Woodland Cemetery. And I'll mention what happened after that at, at the end of the talk here and just momentarily. Um, so the book wants to take that material evidence that we can find at the cemetery seriously as historic sources. Um, we also want to put them on the same page and compare them with one another. We also recognize that cemeteries are not like any other historic sites containing the bodies of people. You know, human remains gives them a real charged nature. Uh, there's a lot more at stake at a site with bodies located at them than another type of historic site that may not have burials associated with it. And uh, a lot of modern scholars have tried to suggest that there's nothing inherently sacred about any type of architecture. But when we look at burial grounds, it, it is certainly true that the, the nature of them as sacred sites is constructed by people at certain times. But it's also universally true that in almost every human society across human history, um, societies have treated the dead with a certain amount of care and reverence that suggests that they are not just any other category. So the, the book tries to balance um, that theoretical approach, let's say, to, to what it means to be a burial ground and how those ideas about the dead changed over different cultures and different periods of time. And so the last thing I'll just say before launching into some specific examples is the argument of the book. What happens when we put all of these graveyards onto the same page? Uh, what seems to me that the book tries to put forth is that we have a tremendous amount of change that takes place in the manner of burial, how graves are marked, how gra graveyards are organized, um, how different ethnic groups or racial groups interact. But within it all, that color line um, separating Europeans and their descendants from the indigenous, from the Africans and their descendants uh, holds very strong throughout all of those changes. So even though say St. John's Churchyard looks quite different from Hollywood Cemetery in its uh, setup and in its markers, they still, despite those changes, held the same relationship to upholding that sense of distinction between white burials and the graves of, of those others. And then as a further point on that thesis, on that argument, is that we may be seeing something different happening now. Are we in a new era in which we are starting to understand these connections across the sites? A lot of the reclamation work taking place at some of these historic African-American cemeteries is not necessarily those anymore of only the black families associated with that particular site, but there are newcomers, uh, white families, students, um, Jews, Christians, uh, atheists coming together in ways to recognize the importance of these sites in a brand new way that they had not necessarily shown that type of engagement in the city's past. So the book tries to grapple with this, this new landscape that we're in, these new forces that seem to be reshaping the burial landscape. And so our first stop is with the indigenous burials. Um, of course, we recognize that we're on Powhatan land here at the falls of the James River. And so really the only 
publicly marked grave that's not just an individual burial within a, a cemetery that has another type of a character is this stone here, uh, which is marked as Powhatan's grave. That's Chief Powhatan, head of the Powhatan chiefdom, who was said, according to the late 1800s, late 19th century guidebooks of the city, and we can see this postcard here, was said to be buried on the Mayo property just east of Richmond. Um, I, I think that's a folk tale, a legend. The Pamunkey tribe to the east in King William County um, points to Powhatan's actual grave on, on the reservation there. But uh, this was a local story that at least if not historically accurate, uh, the, the story of Powhatan's grave here on the Mayo land at least provided some discussion for what it meant to have indigenous graves on this land. And so they moved the stone that was supposed to have marked Powhatan's grave from the Mayo property into Chimborazo Park. So maybe some of you have seen it there uh, in 1924 where it's still reinterpreted as a Powhatan stone, although its associations with burial have, have been softened somewhat. Um, there has been a revival and efforts to try to change this landscape. A lot of indigenous remains had been collected by artifact hunters or even archaeologists and stored in warehouses or in museums. And lately, the NAGPRA, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, passed by Congress in 1990, has provided a mechanism to return those graves, uh, excuse me, those um, those human remains and other associated grave goods to the related tribes for reinterment uh, there. So now we start at the beginning of the city uh, with the St. John's Church, which was originally known as Henrico Parish Church when it was founded in 1741. And so if we look at the image here from 1836, you can see a lot of the character of the site. Uh, the burials took place around the church in the way that European burials typically did. Um, it was on the highest point of ground in the original city. It's overlooking that river and, and the, the waterfront below. It had a formal enclosure around it. And yet there was not much organization in the yard per se. The graves were scattered here or there throughout the churchyard. And they had a lot of different types of grave markers there. But maybe the one thing we could say that they all had in common is that they were oriented due east. Uh, and so they had a, a real sense of the importance of facing Jerusalem or the rising of the sun or something like that. But this was a, a sacred space, literally, associated with the church. And as far as we know, there were, in essence, no black burials that were allowed to take place within the churchyard here. And so here's an example of a couple of those early markers. The earliest one is on your bottom left, and that is the marker for Robert Rose, a minister who died near Richmond in 1751. When he died, he uh, owned more than 100 enslaved Africans in a number of plantations throughout the colony. Um, and he was buried in a place of honor here in the churchyard. And he has a very long epitaph on this chest tomb that was brought in from England to mark his grave and it cites him as a defender of liberty, which is ironic in that way, but also ironic because it foreshadows St. John's connection to Patrick Henry, who gave his give me liberty or give me death speech at St. John's Church in 1775. And that would lead to the creation of an organization, the Historic Richmond Foundation, that would care for this site and indeed continue to sometimes deepen the divide, the racial divides in the community um, sometimes clearing out African-American renters and businesses that were in the neighborhood of the church in the early part of the 20th century uh, to try to create what those um, preservationists believed was a more appropriate setting for this site. On the right, we go back to the 1790s to see the grave marker that's more of a local example of a sandstone upright headstone that may have been carved, as we can see here, by the shop of Abraham Shield, who died fairly young at 28 years old um, from Durham, England. So moving on this early stage, we see the so-called burial ground for Negroes as it is marked on this 1809 map that presents a very different type of site 
than St. John's Churchyard up on the top of the hill. This is placed on a difficult hillside, a very steep hillside. You can see from the map that N is the site of the city gallows. So associating black lives and deaths with criminality, even in the, this period, early period. And then there's also M, which represents the city magazine, the powder magazine. So this was seen by white authorities as a utilitarian site, as not a sacred site. There was no formal enclosure around it. And indeed, um, black graves, it was said to wash down into the current of Shaco Creek uh, during this period of its use. Well, after protests by the black community, the city eventually opened up a different site that we'll see in just a moment. But in the bottom right, you can see how quickly the city repurposed that uh, away from its use as a African burial ground into the site for a school for poor white children, the Lancastrian school, and then ultimately the site of the city jail there in 1817, just one year after it uh, was no longer used for African American burials. So uh, a very, as I say, different treatment of that site. Here's what we can see on the way to its use today, its acknowledgement today as the African burial ground. On the right, you see some modern signage, as well as some offerings and libations that community members have left. And then on the left, you see the uh, parking lot captured by one of VCU's photography students, Shannon Marola in 2008, as part of an exhibition that she uh, mounted to try to call attention to the conditions of those sites before it was reclaimed. Um, well, moving forward in time to 1824, uh, after St. John's Churchyard was considered full, the city opened up a new burial ground for white persons, as it described it. And it was titled here, the New Burying Ground on this plan of 1824. And you can see how different it looks from that churchyard. It's got a gridded plan. They sold city uh, the little plots to individual families. So it was almost like buying real estate in the city proper. Um, they had decorative plantings throughout. Uh, they also barred African-Americans from even being within the formal enclosure of the grounds unless they were doing so in the capacity of servants. Criminals, white criminals were not allowed to be buried in Shaco Hill Cemetery as it would become known. And so this is setting up a fairly exclusive site that would succeed St. John's Churchyard as, as the city's primary burial ground. It would ultimately expand to about 12 acres. And here's a couple of those early markers and monuments you can see, some very ambitious ones. On the left is the grave marker of Jane Stenard, who died in 1824. Um, she was famous for being the mother of Robert Stenard, who was uh, a friend, a childhood friend of Edgar Allan Poe. And on her epitaph, her inscription there, her husband praised her, quote, purity and tenderness of heart. So uh, as a woman here in town, this is clearly one of the most public statements and long lasting statements that was associated with her as we see on the left in this pedestal and urn grave marker. On the right is the grave of John Marshall and Mary Marshall. John Marshall, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who lived in Richmond when he died in 1835. His chest tomb was placed alongside that of his wife. And those Edgar Allan Poe connections and those John Marshall connections really helped solidify uh, the momentum for preservation at Shaco Hill Cemetery in the 20th century. But we can move along to see a comparable site set up by the free black community. As I say, the free black community protested those original conditions down in Shaco Bottom. And so beginning with a group in 1815 that called itself the Burying Ground Society of Free People of Color of the city of Richmond, it created what would become known as Cedarwood Cemetery right here on the map on the left. And uh, it, they, it was their own piece of property. They could manage and control the memorials that went up and how it was maintained and the site itself. And ultimately they were joined by five additional societies, um, three before the war, the Union Mechanics Group, Ebenezer Group, the Methodist Group. And then after the Civil War, after emancipation, the Sons and Daughters of Ham, and Sycamore Cemetery. So that this became ultimately a 12 acre site owned by and for the black community, um, one of the earliest in the state. And this may be our earliest marker, our earliest African-American memorial in the city, perhaps in the state. It's uh, dedicated here to Philip N.J. Wyth, who died as a young man in 1827. And we see up there, this stone is placed here by Benjamin Wyth. 
who was the brother of Philip N.J. Wyth. Um, the city took over ownership of the, of the Barton Heights cemeteries is what these were eventually known as in the early 20th century. And uh, they went somewhat downhill and were not cared for until a descendant, Denise Lester, came along in the late 1990s and really galvanized a new effort to tell the history of that site, get it listed on the National Register, put up a new fence around there and bring people back there for tours and picnics and other ways to engage with the history of this very important site. Um, across the valley, this is on the north side of town, there is a companion site. This was the, this is the site that I called in my book, the second African burying ground because it succeeded the original African burial ground in Shaco Bottom. And this one opened up in 1816 and lasted until 1879. And in that year, the city had declared that it was full. It opened up originally in 1816 with two acres, one for free people of color and one for the enslaved. Ultimately, it would expand to perhaps over 30 acres, as you can see in the bottom right by a descendant, Lenore McQueen's map research there. But once the city was done using this as a burial site, and I should say that we've found only a few interment records for it that are, that are quite precious that tell us the names of some of the individuals buried there, what they died of, if they were enslaved, who their owners were. And we found those at the Library of Virginia in the upper right. But unfortunately, the big picture that you see on the left is what we see there today. Um, a gas station that was built on the site when the city finally divested itself of those original acres in 1960. Um, but uh, there is some rebirth happening there uh, with Lenora McQueen's advocacy. The city has purchased back these original acres. There's a state historic marker going in and we're making an attempt to put this on the National Register of Historic Places. And surely there's gonna be a new way to tell the story of the site beyond what we can see there today. Um, across the street there is Hebrew Cemetery, another real landmark uh, for the Southern landscape. This is one of the oldest continually operating Jewish cemeteries in the South. Um, it was gridded the same way that uh, the Cedarwood Group was gridded and the Shaco Hill Cemetery was gridded. Uh, this shows a delicate balance between assimilation into the majority culture in Richmond and distinctiveness in terms of uh, Jewish funeral traditions and Jewish culture and Jewish uh, uh, faith. And so the, the cemetery itself shows that tension between assimilation and distinctiveness, I think quite well. You can see a couple examples of that with the first grave in the area of Benjamin Wolf, who was a member of city council. And you can see on his chest tomb there to the left, that part of it is in Hebrew and the other part of his inscription is in English. Um, and there's been a later inscription noting its pride of place as being the first interment in that particular cemetery. And then on the right, you see some quite distinctive Jewish symbols of the, the ha priestly hands raised in blessing uh, for the Kohanim indicating uh, the, the family uh, line there of those particular burials. And so you see that Hebrew script, Hebrew calendar, but also some English script, at least on Mark Emanuel's gravestone there on the right as well. And sometimes those two scripts say two di very different types of things, perhaps suggesting different types of audiences. And so we see the uh, further dynamic in the soldiers section, in the Confederate soldiers section that holds the remains of 30 Jewish Confederate soldiers who died during the war and who were gathered into that section by a ladies memorial association affiliated with the Jewish community, called themselves the Hebrew Ladies Memorial Association. And they set out a flyer uh, to raise funds to provide for uh, a marker for those graves, as you can see on the right, circulated to the Israelites of the South. And then the marker that they raised or the, the, the monument is this incredible cast iron fence around the outside of that, that uh, section. You can see the crossed sabers, the laurel wreaths, the stacked muskets, the furled flags, the cap. I believe that this, when it went up in 1868, was one of the earliest memorials dedicated to the Confederacy or the memory of the Confederacy in the entire city. So a, a really um, significant development there. 
Uh, but of course, Hebrew Cemetery can't tell the whole history of the Jewish community in town. On the left is the site of the first Jewish cemetery in the city, downhill from St. John's Churchyard in what was known as the Franklin Street Burying Ground that was founded in 1791 with the beginnings of that Beth Shalom congregation in town. And then later on, uh, Eastern European Jews, when they arrived in the city in the late 1800s, early 20th century, uh, they did not always mix in with the more assimilated um, group associated with Beth Shalom or Beth Ahaba. And so here we see Sir Moses Montefiore Cemetery on the east end of town um, that represents some of those Eastern European Jewish traditions um, as, as distinct from those at Hebrew Cemetery. Now we're moving forward into the 1800s with the rural cemetery movement. If you've heard anything about cemeteries in Richmond, chances are you've heard about Hollywood Cemetery. And Hollywood Cemetery was an experiment at the time. Look at the design of Hollywood as compared with that new burying ground or the Shaco Hill Cemetery that we looked at earlier. We see those curly cues, those picturesque lines that were intended to create a site of particular beauty and in inviting comfort for families that were going to be attending the burial or visiting the remains of their loved ones there. It overlooked the river. Um, it was, it was a, a really significant site on the outside of the city at the time. And it was successful enough in 1854, the city did something like a copycat version of it with Oakwood Cemetery, which was founded in 1854 with about 66 acres. And even though it's not on the James River, you can still see those curvilinear designs uh, inviting visitors to take a more leisurely path through the cemetery. And also just that word cemetery itself or Hollywood and Oakwood indicating a, a softer approach to death, a more pastoral ideal there. But of course, looking at the timeline, we hit the Civil War of the 1860s, soon after both of those are founded. And so my chapter here on these two cemeteries is entitled the Confederate Cemeteries because the numbers and significance of Confederate burials there uh, really dictate a lot of their character uh, from then until now. We get at Hollywood, the, the first battlefield casualty uh, buried in Hollywood Cemetery there is Henry L. Wyatt for the entire war. After the war in 1869, the Hollywood Ladies Memorial Association raises a tremendous amount of money to put up this pyramid, a 90 foot tall pyramid of James River granite to commemorate the loss of the soldiers buried in the soldiers section. Uh, and then on the right, ultimately, President Jefferson Davis of the Confederate States was brought from New Orleans to, for his family circles burial site uh, in Hollywood today. Um, we think about 10 or 11,000 Confederate dead were buried at Hollywood at the end of the war. And then that would continue to rise after the war as well. Um, Memorial Day traditions gathered at Hollywood and Oakwood after the Civil War. Here we see a Harper's Weekly view of this genteel white crowd visiting in 1867, uh, the second Memorial Day. The first Memorial Day brought out basically the entire white population of the city to decorate Confederate graves, nearly 20,000 uh, attendees that day. And then at Oakwood Cemetery, also providing uh, a mechanism for Confederate grief and for the, the birth of the lost cause um, memory of the war. And there we see those rough Confederate soldier burials during the war from 1865. Uh, there was about 16,000 Confederate dead in Oakwood Cemetery by the end of the war. Putting Hollywood and Oakwood together the total of their Confederate dead amounts to about 10% of the entire Confederate Army dead. So this is a, a real sense of gravity for the amount of um, Confederate dead represented in these two cemeteries. And then on the right, we see another photograph from Brian Palmer showing the ongoing um, Confederate Memorial Day or Flag Day traditions that take place at these cemeteries. All right, I'm moving towards the end now. We've just got a couple other sites to, to touch upon. Of course, the book goes into much greater detail, but the National Cemetery, Richmond National Cemetery, uh, there is one of five national cemeteries founded after the Civil War for Union soldiers alone, for Union casualties alone. And so this is a very significant development. 
that is not welcomed in open arms by white residents of the city, but certainly for African Americans, uh, Richmond National plays a very important place. Uh, we see here these graves. These are about 6,000 internments brought from battlefields or prisoner of war sites and reinterred with honor here at Richmond National Cemetery around a central flagpole with a keeper's lodge at the front and a walled uh, enclosure around the outside. And we see on the left just one example of what I believe are some of the first deliberate integrated burials in the city. So here's one example of Cosby Washington, a member of the United States Colored Troops, uh, African-American uh, unit within the Union Army, uh, buried with honor alongside white soldiers from the Union Army. And you can see on the right the, the military element of the cemetery, the challenge it would have presented to those who were more affiliated with the Confederacy. There were no Confederate soldiers allowed to be buried in these national cemeteries at the time of their opening. And black and white veterans would participate in uh, Memorial Days at the national cemeteries for decades after the war. Um, Evergreen and East End Cemetery, we've seen them already at the beginning of my presentation here today. They're located to the east of Oakwood Cemetery. In my book, I call them the post-emancipation uplift cemeteries. This is the time period where um, the promise of reconstruction was starting to fall away for newly emancipated African-Americans. And so African-Americans in Jackson Ward and elsewhere are having to build their own institutions, their own banks, their own businesses, their own newspapers, and here we see their own cemeteries. And so East End and Evergreen are founded by private Black organizations to provide a place of dignity and rest uh, for African-American families in the 1890s and beyond. Um, but those of us who know something about them know that they went into some decline. Here's a few images of their heyday of seeing Maggie Walker tending some of her family plots in the upper right, or the Braxton Mausoleum, this beautiful Art Deco construction on the left, uh, the Farrar family plot in the upper part, or the Rebecca Mitchell plot on the bottom. Uh, but look at the overgrowth that starts to come in in the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1990s. And so it would take a, a real community effort to try to reclaim these cemeteries. There was a dedicated vandalism attack on these cemeteries. Bodies were taken out of the mausoleum. Uh, gravestones were smashed and taken away. And an incredible amount of trash was dumped on these cemeteries for generations in the mid 20th century into the present. When volunteers began clearing them, we see on the bottom um, just some of the thousands of automobile tires alone that were strewn throughout Evergreen and East End Cemetery um, that volunteers were able to dispose of and take a haul away uh, in the last 10, 20 years or so. And so here we see what I thought was a real sense of rebirth for the community of the Friends of East End Cemetery and other grassroots volunteer groups gathering students, as I say, and old folks and newcomers and longtime Richmonders, people who did not have family members buried here, but recognizing their critical nature and their uh, connection to Richmond's history overall. And so here's one of these just magic moments where the students are uncovering a marker that had been um, uh, covered over for perhaps decades. Um, we've done a lot to try to create maps for the cemeteries. The Friends of East End, I, I think, uh, deserve all of our thanks and gratitude for the tremendous amount of work that they've done. Uh, now East End and Evergreen are in the hands of the Enrichment Foundation. Um, that has not been as, as happy in an, as an engagement for, for me and, and my students personally, but we can talk about that down the line. Uh, one last cemetery here is Woodland Cemetery where Marvin Harris has joined some of the volunteer forces. This is where Arthur Ashe is buried. Woodland gets going uh, in the early 19-teens, 1917 or so. And so there's some fantastic reclamation efforts taking place there. And so I'd encourage uh, anybody who has some volunteer time that they might wanna spend reclaiming some of these critical spaces to turn to uh, the volunteer effort out at Woodland Cemetery these days. So, uh, hopefully we have some time for questions. I was going to mention some of the other newer immigrant sites and some of the things that the epilogue discusses, uh, but uh, I'll just conclude by saying that cemeteries are not sleepy. There's a lot that goes on. There's a lot that changes. 
And I just wonder whether this moment of reclamation is going to be fleeting or whether we've really reached a point in our engagement with these sites that represents a, a change from some of the dynamics of the past. So I'll, I'll stop screen share there and uh, hope to invite any questions that folks might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you to, um, we have um, 40 people in the audience, about 50 some people registered for this event. So thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, please post your questions in uh, Q&A, raise your hand. Um, I will start with Leanne Craig's question, um, which was the first one posted. Um, and Rob Tomes um, asks, asks if your book is on sale in, in a local bookstore. So Ryan, you can probably start with that and then I'll go on to Leanne's question. Sure, the Chop Suey in Carytown uh, has been a great friend to local authors. They carry the book there and I believe the VCU Barnes and Noble bookstore carries it as well. So Rob, thank you for that question. Um, I should also mention, I was really happy that the Richmond Public Library has a copy for folks to check out and our own VCU library has a digital version, an ebook version. So no need to buy the book unless you uh, feel like uh, parting with a little cash that way. So there's some great library copies available too. Great. Thank you. So this is Leanne's question. Uh, did the 19th century preservationists of St. John's Church intend or hope that their actions would promote tourism to Churchill? To ask the question more broadly, was there a goal to their preservation beyond the infrastructure itself? Yeah, so great question. What was happening at St. John's Church was that it was becoming a national pilgrimage site for people who were wanting to see the place where Patrick Henry gave that famous oration. And people would come and it was just a little congregation that, that St. John's Church congregation was never particularly large in town. And they more or less got overrun by people coming in and breaking off pieces of pews or breaking off pieces of tombstones to take back with them as mementos. And so the congregation decided that they just couldn't maintain an open door policy for these visitors anymore. But there was a number of business leaders and religious leaders who formed in the 1930s to try to provide a future for that site as a, as a historic property. And they very much had tourism in mind. Um, they were thinking about all these people coming in. And even today, if you talk with the, the staff at the foundation, they get people, international visitors who come to visit that site. And they do a great job, I think, of telling the story of that site, not just in terms of Patrick Henry, but its place in the city overall. And uh, it's the, the history of the churchyard too. Um, and it's also, one more thing I'll say about it is, that was one of the first episodes in the city where you had a, an, a neighborhood approach to preservation. In the 1930s, 1940s, the historic Richmond Foundation was created and other local uh, associations were created to create what they thought would be, as I said, a more appropriate setting for that site. So they weren't just thinking about the building or even just thinking about the, the cemetery, the, the churchyard. They were even thinking about the, the housing stock and the, what was across the street from it. And so it had the unfortunate effect of displacing a lot of the black community that was there. But in terms of overall historic preservation strategy, it did provide um, a vision that could be adopted by other groups that could start to see these things as not just an isolated building, but as connected to their surroundings in some way that would, in, in certain cases, help out African-American neighborhoods as well as, as the more predominant white neighborhoods that had received that kind of preservation funding in the past. Thank you. Uh, Bridget Ferguson, you're next. Um, you can ask your question live. Okay. Um, hi, Professor Smith. I just remember when I was conducting my research on Hal L. Thomas, who was a surgeon and grave robber, and he played a massive part in what you referenced, the like snatching of interred bodies of those of African descent. I like really struggled to find sources related to the subject. And since you dove so much into the evolution of the African-American burial sites and cemeteries and their preservation and desecration, like I was curious if you, while researching, encountered issues or had trouble locating sources related to these topics. 
Wonderful to see you again, Bridget. Bridget put together, as you heard, a fantastic podcast, a deep dive into the career of Howell Thomas, who had been a, a doctor on the faculty at the Medical College of Virginia. And a lot of the biographies of him will celebrate his national reputation as an educator and as a surgeon, as a, as a physician. And Bridget's study covered that, but she also did the phenomenal service of showing how he was also responsible for procuring black bodies for these anatomical studies. And so we see a more rounded portrait of uh, Dr. Thomas than we might have gotten a few years ago or from a different researcher. So my hat's off to Bridget for, as she said, the difficulty of trying to track down all of that research. I think when we talk about the history of grave robbing in the city, we tend to focus on Chris Baker. So if you know, if you might have heard that name, Sean Yutzi's film, Until the Well Run Dry, Runs Dry, tells the story of Chris Baker, who was active as the anatomical man at the Medical College of Virginia in the 1870s and 1880s uh, to go out and procure those anatomical specimens. Um, but so much of the focus on Chris Baker himself, he's so fascinating. He's an African-American man. He lives in the Egyptian building. Um, you know, his place in the community is, is quite fraught. And so that's fascinated historians, but we miss the full picture if we don't look at who his employers are, who are tasking him with going out to, to who are shielding white burial grounds from these kinds of predations and allowing those kinds of predations to take at black burial sites. And so Bridget, it's research like yours that helps us refocus that story. And to just answer your question about sources overall, there definitely were things I wanted to know and wasn't able to find out. Um, I, I did a lot of oral history and talking with people who had been connected with the cemeteries, either as advocates or activists or as descendants in some way. Uh, but I also uh, did as much archival research as I could, you know, going back and looking at city council minutes or looking at deeds. And so that was, frankly, uh, and I, I know Leanne Craig is here on the call too, that my other colleagues in the history department uh, can testify that Bridget, sometimes the search, even if it's frustrating and even if it doesn't always pan out, the search can be just as exciting and just as rewarding um, as frustrating as it can be at times. So yeah, that, uh, I, that's part of the reason why it took 10 years or so to put this book together is because it, it, it takes a lot to cover all of this ground and there's still plenty of stuff I wanna go back to and research more. Thank you for that. Um, Meg Homer has um, a question. Um, first, she says, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. I'm curious about what your research tells us about how people tend to engage with burial grounds. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the one hand, many of us think of cemeteries as a place of solemnity and quiet reverence, but on the other, it seems that many burial places are sites of more activity like picnics and celebrations of life. Um, initially, she says, I'm inclined to think that the difference in how we engage with the sites is due to different cultural religious practices, but it seems like celebratory events such as picnics, etc., cetera, um, with very different origins, including Hollywood and Barton Heights bur bur burial grounds. So can you share your thoughts? I think that last sentence just cut off, but you, you get the gist of it. I do. That's a fantastic question. And, you know, it, it points to what I think is so powerful about these cemeteries is that it points out how our own beliefs, our own assumptions and expectations about how to treat the dead or what's going to happen to our own individual body after we die or something like that is so contingent on the time and place that we live in. People didn't always, that's the beauty of history, right? People didn't always think or do the same things. And these burial grounds bring that firmly to life. It's St. John's Churchyard people would reuse the same plot of ground over and over again. They talk about finding the remains of someone as they're digging a new grave and then just putting the new grave on top of it. I think most of us today would be horrified by that idea. But for them, th there was nothing horrifying about that. They, they expanded the church on top of existing burials. And for them, again, that, that wasn't a desecration of those church members. That was bringing them even closer into the arms of the church itself. And so those attitudes and those assumptions just change throughout time. And when you talk about activity at the burial grounds, um, I think the people that set up Hollywood Cemetery would have been offended if no one came out 
to visit on a Sunday, to, to bring a picnic perhaps, and to spend some time with family members there. You know, I don't know maybe how they would feel about a rock and roll band or an ice cream truck, but uh, they certainly saw those as sites for the living as much as for the dead. Whereas I think you're exactly right, for the modern day, we do have a bit more of a standoffish assumption about that these should be quiet places, you know, people perhaps shouldn't go there unless they're going for a funeral. And that's, that's a real challenge I have when I teach these classes is many of the students in my classes have never been to a cemetery other than for a very sad occasion, a very solemn occasion. And so I certainly don't want to um, make that situation worse for them, but I, I, I try to show them that we can be doing history there that doesn't have to be tied to those more emotional um, family painful memories that we might associate with cemeteries. So that, that, you know, death is a part of life. There's a wonderful scholar, Philip Arias, who looks at the modern attitude towards death and how it's changed over time. And he believes that our modern approach to death is, is not very healthy. This idea that cemeteries should be off limits, places that we don't go or that we're scared to go. And he thinks that we need to have a more organic, accepting um, familiar relationship with death, which which might mean spending more casual time in the cemeteries. So that's it's it's a great question that shows us you know, what history can teach us about a question like that. Wonderful. Um, we have several more questions, which I will try to combine into two remaining questions. So thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, these two are technical questions. Uh, Stephanie Wilkes asks, who has records of Evergreen and East End cemeteries? And Miriam um, Awaki, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, asks if you have examples of other cemeteries of recent immigrant or minority communities. Right. Okay, so who has records of East End Cemetery? The short answer to that is no one. Um, there's not been any original records from the East End Memorial Burial Association that set up East End Cemetery in 1897. That means that there are notices in newspapers or there's death certificates or there's occasionally funeral director records that make mention of burials there. But other than the markers that survive on the grounds themselves, um, were, were a bit at a loss or the family members' memories uh, of engaging with that site. And so again, that's why these physical sites are such critical sources for the historical stories that we want to know and, and, and tell. Evergreen is in a bit better of a situation in that some of Evergreen Cemetery's records, original records remain. There are some annual care ledgers. There's a few internment registers. There's some correspondence but it is not comprehensive. And unfortunately, some of the internment records that we have for Evergreen Cemetery don't match up with the, the actual plan of the grounds if you look at which section people are buried in. And so I would describe, unfortunately, the, the records for Evergreen Cemetery as, as somewhat uneven or, or scattered and, and not always as reliable as we might wish. But those are located at the Library of Virginia. Uh, recently with the acquisition of Evergreen Cemetery um, by the Enrichment Foundation, they were able to gather from the private owners what records did remain and they're now at the Library of Virginia available for, for research. Um, so a different, couple of different situations which contrast that with Hollywood Cemetery which has it's minutes that go all the way back to its founding in 1847. And so you can go month by month and see exactly who was buried when and how much they were spending on posts for to replace the fence with and everything. So the, the contrast, even just in record keeping and record maintenance is quite stark. Now, the, the other question is, is obviously a big one on for minority communities. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Latinx immigrants or Latin American immigrants into our region, um, Asian immigrants into our re region, or um, uh, other newer 20th century populations that have grown in a way that were not present in the city from the 18th or 19th centuries in as many numbers. And my book, in terms of its historical focus, stopped around the early 20th century before the real boom in global immigration into the United States after the changing of the immigration laws in, in the 1960s and 1965. And so what I did in my epilogue is try to gesture that these sites are gonna be critically important. The Islamic garden section in Riverview Cemetery, 
or the traditions of uh, Latinx immigrants for uh, or the Latinx community at the Sacred Heart Center on the South Side. Th those are stories that are absolutely central to our life in Central Virginia today. Um, but that's going to require uh, a part two, a second volume of the book to get into those connections. Um, so there are a few examples here and there of Syrian um, grave markers in Mount Calvary Catholic Cemetery or of uh, Japanese immigrants in Hollywood Cemetery. Um, but overall, those are just unfortunately strands in my book since I don't cover that post-1965 period quite as robustly. Peter Kirkpatrick asks, when one walks between the James River and Hollywood Cemetery, one sees several tombstones and parts of tombstones that are outside the grounds of the cemetery and going down the slope. Do we know <laughs> why these tombstones are thrown out of the Hollywood Cemetery? Well, you know, that reminds us of that tragic story of the Columbian Harmony Cemetery up in Washington, D.C., where they found gravestones used as riprap on the Potomac River. And so gravestones do have a way of being displaced by highway projects or by um, vandalism or by other uh, nefarious activities. And so I don't know for Peter Kirkpatrick's question there, are those particular gravestones? I haven't seen them. Uh, maybe I need to take a walk down there, but there are two other cemeteries next to Hollywood. One is the city-owned Riverview Cemetery that was founded in the 1880s, and another is the Mount Calvary Cemetery by, uh, run by the Catholic Church that was founded also in the 1880s. And so I'm wondering if the property lines um, moved around somehow, or if a storm might have washed some of those down. Uh, my first question is, do those property owners, does the city does uh, the, the superintendent of Mount Calvary, does Hollywood know about that? And, and Peter, that's a great eye. And that's one of the things that makes investigating these sites in person so rewarding is that there's always surprises to be found. And so unfortunately we've seen episodes like that in the past, but that's this is a surprise to me. I'm sorry, I don't have information on those in particular. A storm. Yeah, we, we've you. had storms that have washed out graves and washed out markers. So that could be, especially that close to the river. Thank you both for the questions and, and the answers. Uh, Bernard Moyt has his hand up and we will conclude in the next few minutes. Can you hear me? I can, hello Bernard. Yes. Hi Ryan, fantastic uh, presentation. I enjoyed it um, a lot. And uh, it, it's really a mark of a good historian at work. Bring, uh, I think when people think about 10 years to produce a book, they may think, well, with what, how do you all do that? But that, that is the case indeed. Now, I just wondered, having um, unearthed all that you have and looking at the, the various cemeteries and from different ethnicities, what have you come away with, with regard to, let's say, the history of Richmond over the time period that you've studied? Right. A fantastic question, Bernard, and you know very well what it's like to work on a book and labor over a book uh, of a labor of love for a long time like that. So we you can commiserate as historians with the research process. Um, what I come away with, as I say it is, I ended the book wondering how optimistic to be, um, wondering how optimistic to think that with the reclamation of the African burial ground, with the recovery of East End and Evergreen Cemetery and, and many of the portions of those once uh, neglected or vandalized sites, that maybe, maybe I should be optimistic, that maybe this means that there is some kind of a realignment, a new community that we can envision for our area. And I saw the burial grounds as being one of the mechanisms that would, that would put that together. But in the end, I tried to temper some of that optimism by interviewing as many people as I could. And I include many of those voices in the concluding chapter of the book. And maybe I'll just read it here. Uh, th there's a, a quote that just knocked me out from Marvin Harris, who uh, is now helping lead the restoration effort at Woodland Cemetery, the historic African-American cemetery. And I asked him, I said, are you optimistic about where things are headed in the cemeteries cleanup and by extension in terms of their place and the recognition in the city? And he said simply, I am optimistic about what I am going to do. So he's a longtime Richmonder. He lived through segregation, went to a segregated school, 
he knows enough, he's seen enough not to give me a really pat answer, a really glib answer that yes, you know, things are going to change, things are getting better. And so he turned it back on himself to show, I know what it is that I'm going to do. And, and that really, that quote gave me, gave me chills and made me think that that's the message to take away from here. And so uh, I could say a lot more, Professor Moyd, about your question, thinking about it over time, you know, seeing how the different ethnicities tried to claim a foothold, claim a space in this community, tried to honor their burials, only to see episode after episode of those uh, claims on human dignity uh, assaulted under assault. And so that's probably a longer conversation than we could have. So I, I don't know here at the end of the book how optimistic to be on this, but I do know that um, there's not much more at stake in recognizing someone's personhood than in recognizing the, the dignity of their burial. And so we have to keep these places front and center of, of our attention and our efforts to try to create a better community. Right, thank you, Ryan. Um, we had several more questions. I'm so sorry we won't get to them. Um, I will just read them and then um, uh, one of them it could actually speak to uh, Bernard's um, question about the role of the important um, and the importance of elected officials in, the, in this work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then Matthew Nichol also asked, what would you say are the things that catch your eye the most when looking at cemeteries, either in person or, or in documents? Um, this is a fantastic talk and uh, there are uh, many thank you notes in the chat. I'm not sure if you're following. I just wanted to thank you again for making time uh, for all your work and for the support of the HRC, um, not just this year, but since the center was founded. Um, our, I just want to mention that our next event um, in the VC, Meet VCU Authors uh, will be in two weeks on Monday, September the 27th. Professor Catherine uh, Murphy-Judy will be in conversation with Be Betsy Starnes, who will speak about Catherine's recent book, Teaching Language Online. Um, and I'd also like to draw your attention to one of our um, most interesting events and uh, highly anticipated uh, next week at the HRC, September the 23rd, um, which is a Thursday afternoon at 6 p.m. Uh, when we'll welcome Professor Daphne Brooks of Yale University, who will be in conversation with our own Madison Moore about her recent book, Liner Notes for the Revolution, The Intellectual Life of Black Feminist Sound, published this year by Harvard University. And I look forward to seeing many of you on the 23rd. And thank you so much for supporting these events and um, for um, attending today's event. I'm really grateful to everyone. I'm grateful, Christine. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who came. Thank you, Ryan. Excellent talk. Appreciate it.